Our opening keynote presentation today is by thought leader and street level researcher, Charles T. Brown, Arrested Mobility, Exploring the Impacts of Over-Policing BIPOC Mobility in the United States. 2020 exposed the many cracks in our foundation as a country. Access to and through biking is not equally experienced by everyone and it exacerbates our disparities. Safe streets for everyone is bigger than great biking and walking networks. It means that everyone is free to move on our streets and in our neighborhoods and in our communities without the fear of violence, racial profiling or police brutality. We have so much to do to live up to and to meet our mission to create a bicycle friendly America for everyone, for everyone. I believe that starts with really listening and being willing to learn and act on how our work can put people at the center, especially those who have been most marginalized and oppressed, to use our influence wherever and whenever we can and to grow into a more powerful and representative force of change. I thank my friend Charles Brown coming back to the National Bike Summit and for speaking with us today. And I encourage everyone to consider ways to incorporate what Charles is teaching in your advocacy. Charles is Senior Research Specialist at the Alan M. Voorhees Transportation Center, Adjunct Professor at the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers University, and a Fellow of the Public Voices Fellowship on, climate, on the Climate Crisis, a partnership of, Yale, of the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication and the Op-Ed Project. He is also a league cycling instructor. Charles's experience and clarity of vision have helped many communities, advocates and organizations grow in understanding and applying that knowledge into action. I'm happy to introduce Charles T. Brown. Board and their partners for having me share today's keynote. Before I get started, I would like to add a disclaimer to my presentation. That is, the views and the thoughts expressed in this presentation are my very own. I in no way am representing in any organization, <clears throat> excuse me, of which I'm affiliated with. Uh, in fact, I um, actually took today off work to uh, give you today's presentation. And so the title of my presentation is Arrested Mobility, Exploring the Adverse Social, Political, Economic, and Health Outcomes of over-policing BIPOC mobility, BIPOC mobility in the US. Now, who am I? Again, you know my name is Charles T. Brown and please include the T, but I identify as a street level researcher and as a pracademic, given my many years inside and outside of academia and the fact that I believe that the answers to many of our problems are found in the street among the people. See, I was reared in rural Mississippi in a town of less than 500 people. And since that time, I have traveled and worked in communities of all sizes, ideologies, and cultures across the US. Some of these towns are blue, some are red, some are green, and many have also been confused. In the words of a great prophet, um, I have 99 problems, but understanding you isn't one. I also want to state that I live by the African proverb, I am because we are. So many of you will ask the question when it comes to today's presentation, why focus or center uh, the discussion around race and ethnicity? I have chosen to prioritize the conversation, the race conversation in my transportation equity work in order to broaden the narrative of transportation planning. See, I'm strongly committed to leading and centering race in all transportation decision-making processes because too often race is glazed over in planning in research and policy development. And unfortunately, this leads to people making assumptions about the communities that we're all tasked to serve. See, instead what you find is that they use proxies such as income, age, sex, gender, education and access to vehicle even are used as alternatives to avoid centering race-based issues. But there is a history of structural racism and its impact across the country and within the communities is often overlooked and unacknowledged, yet it is very pervasive and unmistakably harmful to everyone. So I believe that we as planners, engineers, bicycle advocates, et cetera, we all have a professional and a moral obligation 
to acknowledge that the uneven development of our cities and the resulting racial health and wealth disparities are the result of systemic racism in ingrained within our professions, whether you're in engineering, whether you're in real estate, public policy work, health work, et cetera, pick one. So then what is equity? There are three tenets of equity that I'd like to adhere to. The first one is equity involves trying to give, trying to understand and give people what they need to enjoy full, healthy lives. Equity is also though the presence of justice and fairness within the procedures, the processes, and most importantly, the distribution of resources by institutions or systems. So if you were to ask my Mississippi mother how to locate in, in, inequity, she will tell you, follow the money. See, facing inequities though is more than a desktop exercise or a lens that one puts on. Instead, facing equity issues requires an understanding of the underlying or the root causes of inequalities and oppression within our society. But we must also go deeper than that. Equity requires also a consideration of social identities or intersectionality um, in our work. We must ask ourselves, which identities do we think about the most often? Which identities do we think about the least often? Which of our own identities would we like to learn more about? Which of our identities have the strongest effect on how we perceive ourselves? And then which of our identities have the greatest effect on how others perceive us? The reason why this is important is because for too often, uh, because too often the identities that we think least about are often the very identities that are left from the tables who are cut out of our decision-making processes and whose pain and trauma we normalize for the sake of the greater good. And so this presentation today really isn't about what's seen, it's about what's unseen. And to best illustrate what is unseen, I wanna share with you what I share with all of my graduate students on the first night of class at Rutgers University, their ability to see the unseen. And so I usually ask them a question and give them a context such as, this photo you see is a majority minority neighborhood in the West Ward of Newark, New Jersey. I asked them specifically, what changes or improvements would you like to make to this photo? I'll invite you to do the same. As you're typing this within the chat, unless you've seen this presentation before, what usually happens is that people state, where are the trees? Where's the pedestrian scale lighting? please repair that sidewalk. What about maintenance and the resurfacing of the roadway? Redevelopment or development efforts, facade improvements, place those utilities underground. And of course, people say, where are the bike lanes? The unfortunate part or the part that's really disheartening is that planners, engineers, public health professionals all across this country, for some reason, fail to ask the most important question, where are the people? And that is important because the work that we do is all about people. But most importantly, it's about recognizing and acknowledging the history and the culture of the people that are already there. In the case of the West Ward of Newark, unfortunately, many people do before and after renderings of bicycle inf infrastructure, pedestrian infrastructure, et cetera. And guess what they do? They erase the people that are there out of the future by not including them in the very renderings they create to help to create a vision for that community. And so many engineers ask the question or planners ask the question, why are black people opposed to bike lanes? What they're opposed to is not the idea of bike lanes, but the possibility of being erased from the future when those bike lanes arrive. And so why is this conversation important? in today's context? Well, it's important because there are a plethora of federal, state, and local initiatives, plans, policies, and programs aimed at increasing physical activity and improving pedestrian bicycle safety and mobility among BIPOC people around this country. Many of these great programs include Vision Zero, Complete Streets, Open Streets, Livable Streets, Safe Streets, and Street Streets as a joke. But we all know few of them actually 
ever achieve the goal of removing barriers to people being more physically active or safe, uh, specifically black and brown populations. So the challenges or the opportunities here is that when it comes to these programs, many of them, their current descriptions are ahistorical and apolitical, particularly in regards to the history of systemic and institutional racism within the US. Two, the strategies do not highlight the role of state and municipal law enforcement in discouraging and denying physical activity among uh, Black Indigenous people of color. Three, equitable and inclusive access is listed as a foundational element, but not explicitly as a desired outcome or goal with a tangible organizational commitment to funding organizations that work with and in Black and Brown communities. Fourthly, there is no mention of the overwhelming data highlighting the magnitude of unconscious bias and the criminalization of Blackness or otherness in America, particularly in light of the current climate. And fifth, the strategies do not specifically discuss the need for institutional changes, particularly around increasing diversity, equity, and inclusion, both internally and also externally. And then lastly, we somehow deem these social determinants of health. These are not social determinants of health. These are political determinants of health in these black and brown communities because planning is politically rooted and driven. So you may ask, what then is arrested mobility? Arrested mobility is a phrase that I coined that takes a look at the assertion that Black people and other minorities have historically and presently been denied both by legal and illegal authority, the inalienable right to move, to be moved, or to simply exist in public space. This results in adverse social, political, economic, and health effects that are widespread and intergenerational, but they're also preventable. And so is there a framework for arrested mobility? Yes, and as shown here, arrested mobility is a direct manifestation of racism across four distinct realms, which include the personal realm, the interpersonal realm, the institutional realm, and the cultural realm of racism. These collective realms of racism have resulted in the social construct of race, both locally and globally, and has led to the intentional and deliberate targeting of over-policing Black and Brown people in America. And this over-policing include not only their physical mobility, which is or has a direct relationship, but also their social mobility, which is an indirect relationship of having their physical mobility arrested. And for all the social scientists out there, please understand or note that I understand that the direct relationships between the variables shown here are more complex and nuanced than displayed. So then the next logical question becomes, how are black and brown people over police in America? Well, there is overwhelming data to support, to support that there are three distinct forms in which over-policing manifests in our society. The first one is via policy and planning, whether we're talking zoning, residential segregation, disinvestment, et cetera. The second piece is around law enforcement. This includes law enforcement efforts at the federal, the state, and the local level. And the third piece is around polity or the self-deputization of white citizens, i.e. the Karens throughout the country. See, in the context of the physical mobility, the various degrees of over-policing uh, black and brown mobility in this country are evident and data supports it across all the different modalities. This include whether we're talking walking, biking, driving, taking public transit or private transit, hopping a ride via rideshare, or even using a micro mobility device such as an e-scooter. 
It also happens, unfortunately, regardless of age or whether you're riding your bike in your neighborhood as a three-year-old or taking a ride on the neck of your father. Again, understanding how over-policing arrests the physical mobility of Black people in America is of critical importance to our bicycling community, our pedestrian advocates, our health partners, environmental partners, et cetera. Because it's important if we are to increase the physical activity and the mobility of these populations. So then the next logical question becomes, is there evidence to support arrested mobility across these different modes of transportation? Well, let's start with walking. The most recent and notable cases of over-policing Black mobility via walking or running in the US include the shooting deaths and murders of Ahmaud Aubrey, who was jogging, Trayvon Martin, who was walking, and Mike Brown, who was also walking. Both Ahmad and Trayvon were murdered by self-deputized citizens, and Mike was murdered by law enforcement. The question then becomes, though, so what does the data reveal? Well, let's look at the data. An analysis of five years of tickets issued to pedestrians in Jacksonville, Florida, found that 55% of the tickets were issued to Black individuals, even though only 29% of the total population identified as Black. In that same study, they found that Blacks were three times more likely to receive tickets than whites, mm -hmm. and residents of the city's three poor zip codes were about six times as likely to receive a pedestrian citation as those living in the city's more uh, affluent 34 zip codes. And unfortunately, our sister, Raquel Nelson, was um, charged with um, second degree homicide when her son was killed uh, while crossing the street uh, from a bus stop adjacent to their apartment. The man who later killed her son, he was later found and admitted to drinking and taking painkillers on the night the uh, crash happened. Thankfully, and I say thankfully, the charges against her were dropped in exchange for a guilty plea on jaywalking charges alone. And these jaywalking charges um, were about $200, but we'll talk about jaywalking later. In the context of arrested mobility though, I wish it ended with walking or running. Unfortunately, it does not. It also is present in the case of public transit. And one of the more recent and notable cases of over-policing Black mobility via public transit in the U.S. includes the murder of Oscar Grant III, who was a 22-year-old Black man who was murdered by BART police officers in Oakland, California. But what does the data say? Well, a Marshall Project analysis of New York Division of Criminal Justice Service data from 2014 showed that while the number of turnstile arrests have decreased significantly, what has not changed is who gets arrested. See, 89% of those who get arrested are Black or Hispanic. When they adjusted for um, subway traffic, they also noted that the top 10 neighborhoods in New York with the highest number of arrests per subway swipe were all predominantly Black or Hispanic. And then in the case of our brother, Adrian Napier, a Black teenager, he was tackled and aimed at by 10 police officers for fare evasion. That fare was only $2.75. And then in 2017, Blacks were eight times more likely than whites to be charged for certain transit violations in Portland, Oregon. Thankfully, that policy was later decriminalized in 2018. But in the case of arrested mobility, I wish it ended with public transit. Unfortunately, it does not. It also is present pretty much when we look at driving in this country. And the most recent and notable cases of over-policing Black mobility via driving in the U.S. included the murders of Philando Castile and our queen, Sandra Bland. But what does the data say? A nationwide analysis of policing trends and traffic stops showed that Blacks and Hispanic drivers are stopped disproportionately to white drivers, even though the hit rate of white and Black drivers are similar. They also noted that police are less likely to pull over black drivers at the dusk when the race of the driver is less obvious to law enforcement. This signals 
intentional discrimination. Then in the case of Minnesota, which has been at the epicenter of some of these discussions as of late, a state commission study found that Blacks and Latinos were seven times more likely to be stopped by police in white majority neighborhoods. And then in one case, 47% of the arrests by a local uh, police department were of Black individuals, even though the patrolled area is only 7% Black. But in the case of arrested mobility, I wish it ended with driving. Unfortunately, it does not. It also includes ride sharing. And one of the most notable cases of um, arrested mobility via ride sharing involved researchers from Stanford, MIT, and the University of Washington who found ride sharing drivers discriminate based on race and gender. But what does the data say? Of the 581 app hailing trips recorded, Blacks waited on average 20% longer than white travelers to have their ride accepted on Lyft or Uber. It also took about 30% longer for Blacks to be picked up than white travelers. A scary fact is that on average, female travelers were driven 5% further than females, I mean, than males, given the same start and finish location. And then of course, if you are Black in this country, you may or may not have experienced this once or twice, but 55% of the Blacks who call for a cab at some point have experienced a refusal. But in the case of arrested mobility, I wish it ended there. Unfortunately, it does not. It also takes into consideration if you are a home asleep, such as our queen, Breonna Taylor, or a kid such as Tamir Rice, who simply want to play outside and enjoy himself. So you may be asking the question, if you're all bikes, why does this matter to bicycling? Well, let's look at the data on biking. And there are more than a dozen studies and reports of over-policing Black mobility via biking in the US. I've authored a number of these articles on the issue, but a number, I mean, excuse me, but the more um, notable one of late includes the topic on biking while Black in Chicago, which was a great study done by Chicago Tribune and they found that not a single majority white area ranked in the top 10 for bicycle tickets, despite biking's popularity in white areas of Chicago. Other notable studies are out of Tampa, uh, Florida, Oakland, California, and the one done by Bicycling Mag Magazine. But what does the data say? See, I'm giving you this data because I believe that without data, all you have is an opinion. And I didn't want to bring to this bicycle community an opinion. It's important to bring the facts. And what are the facts? Between 2003 to 2015, Tampa police issued over 10,000 bicycle tickets. 79% of those tickets were issued to Blacks, though only 20% of Tampa's population identifies as Black. During that same 12 year study period, at least 142 tickets were issued to kids age 15 and under, including children as young as three years old. In Oakland, California, 60% of all bicycle stops included black, black cyclists, even though the city of Oakland's population is only about 25% Black. And then taking us again to Chicago, Twice as many bicycle tickets are written in majority black neighborhoods than in majority white or Latino neighborhoods. And in one case, we noted that 321 bicycle tickets were issued in a low income majority black community, whereas only five were issued in a wealthy majority white community. So then the next logical question is, what are the social political economic and health outcomes of over-policing Black mobility in this country? Well, let's take a look at these social, political, economic, and health outcomes, again, bringing to you the data. The data shows that Blacks are 54% less likely to be physically active than whites, regardless of the neighborhood or the individual income levels. Also, regardless of the racial composition 
of the neighborhood. And if you are a black man, a black woman, a black trans, et cetera, in this country, you know too that too often we are forced to attempt to look less threatening when going out to exercise. The data also shows that upward economic mobility is a matter of whether neighborhoods have less segregation. Remember, I've shown you the amount of segregation that takes place in these communities across America. We also see though areas with larger black populations tend to have lower rates of upward mobility, again, signaling the connection between one's physical mobility being arrested and one's upward or social mobility. The data also shows that residential segregation has led to a dearth of hospitals and healthcare providers in majority Black and Hispanic neighborhoods. Then we find that Black's average household income is 60% that of white households, and they're paid less than whites for the same jobs. We also find that they are disproportionately associated with food deserts, made even worse by a lack of access to transportation. And then lastly, what we found is that Blacks consistently have less access to important resources and opportunities like healthcare, supermarket, education, and jobs. And then this sort of transportation disadvantage makes Black people and Brown people more vulnerable to disenfranchisement efforts like lower density of polling places. So then the question becomes for us, how can we create a safe, equitable, and inclusive system for all? Well, what I want to do now is to give you a framework to make decisions around how to make your processes more inclusive. I'll then give you a series of strategies of how to transform culture internally. And then I'll end with a series of actions we can take right now to change things. So with this justice framework, I'll be touching on distributive justice, procedural justice, interactional justice, representational justice, and then lastly, care. In the context of distributive justice, the first question we must always ask is who has physical access to the street, to the park, or to the trail? And by who we must look at not only the different modalities, but also the race and ethnicity and income of a person's. And it's important to disaggregate. This is important because research has shown that the majority of black and brown people do not feel that their children are safe from traffic when bicycling in their neighborhoods. It also shows that less than one in four feel that they can safely bicycle to local parks or to trails from their homes. This tells us that even though these trails, these parks, et cetera, are proximate to these communities, proximity is not access. When it comes to black and brown lived experience, you have to look at the social political atmosphere, not just the physical atmosphere. And then the question then around procedural justice asks, who has influence over the design, the operations and the programming of an activity? This question is important because we know historically and even in present day times that minority youth are not included in planning and transportation decision-making processes. And when it comes to interactional justice, we must ask the question, what makes people feel welcomed or unwanted in a space? This is important because the data shows that African-Americans are two and a half times more likely to be killed by law enforcement. And when it comes to gender, male reported being stopped, males reported being stopped at a rate seven times that of females. But it's not just that dynamic. We must also take into consideration the fatal violence against our transgender and gender non-conforming communities. This goes unfortunately unreported or misreported in transportation and mobility discussions. Ask yourself the question throughout this conference, throughout other conference, how often have you heard people discuss the harm and the violence inflicted among our transgender and gender non-conforming communities? Then we must talk about representational justice. Do people feel they experience 
and their history is represented in a space. This is important because too often we know historical and culturally erasure takes place in communities across this country. And then lastly, a very basic question with, which gets at our humanity. How do people demonstrate their care not only for the space, but also the people in it? This question is important because our systems are and continue to be every single day biased against women, specifically black and brown women, and does not protect our religious minority groups. See, we have to change the culture within our organizations to have it manifest a more equitable and inclusive outcome. And this involves taking a look at equity strategies and recommendations to change the culture internally. And in order to do this, we must advocate for anti-racist values or an anti-racist culture. We must ask or encourage organizations to consider the adoption of racial equity action plans. Notice that I emphasize racial equity action plans. We must then ask for equity trainings, equity performance measures, but also just as important, internal and external equity advisory groups. Why is this important? Because we all need someone or something to hold us accountable to the, to the plans and the policies that we've created. And I know we can do it. How do I know we can do it? Because if my friends in Utah can do it, everyone can do it. And so then the questions become, how do we center equity? In regards to centering equity, I'll take you through racial equity, modal equity, procedural equity, language equity, gender equity, spatial equity, and my favorite equity of all, common sense. And why is this important? It's important because this work is intersectional. So in looking at the first action one must take is we must commit to equity through the adoption of a racial equity action plan. And in the words of the Racial Equity Alliance, racial equity action plan can put a theory of change into action to achieve a collective vision of racial equity. These plans can drive institutional and structural change, which requires resources to implement. That includes time, money, skills, and effort. It also requires local government's will and expertise to change our policies, the way we do business, our habits, and our culture. So the number one thing we must begin to advocate for is racial equity action plans. Again, emphasizing racial. We also need a reparation style infrastructure package for uh, Black, Brown, and low-income communities. This includes bicycle infrastructure, which should include bicycle trails, bike lockers, protected bike lanes, et cetera, pedestrian infrastructure, which includes sidewalks, multi-use path, benches, et cetera, investment in public transit and investment in public art. It must, however, include maintenance as well. It's not enough to build it, you must maintain it. And unfortunately in transportation and mobility, we have a history of not maintaining infrastructure in black, brown, and low-income communities. Action three requires us to ensure the full and fair participation of racialized minority groups. We must do this to avoid, to minimize, or to mitigate disproportionately high and adverse human health and environmental effects, including both the social and economic effects on these minority or low-income uh, populations. Next, we must foster more equitable treatment of diverse languages uh, in the public sphere. We are America, in America, we are very diverse, not only in terms of culture, but also in terms of language. And if we are to do this work and be inclusive and equitable, language equity and access, as well as literacy is a huge component of that. So please ensure that your materials, your documents, et cetera, are translated into multiple language, which is crucial to support effective communication. Action five, we must document and increase mobility and access for elderly and persons with disabilities. And when it comes to persons with disabilities, 
we must think beyond just the physical disability, but also include persons with uh, cognitive disabilities as well. And then driving home this point about engaging with and deepening our understanding of behavior and usage, usage differences among women and female-headed households is important. Same being the engagement with our foreign-born populations as well. Again, if we're equitable and inclusive, everyone has a seat at the table. And as we build out these systems, we advocate for investment and uh, maintenance. We must evaluate and mitigate the unintended consequences of improved mobility and access. We must address concerns about gentrification and displacement. And why must we do this? We must do this because trees planted and minority communities mature just in time for gentrification to take place. So I asked the question, is it unintentional if it continues to happen over and over and over again? Is it unintentional? And then number nine, we must analyze the impact of current and past zoning and land use decisions. This is critically important because it has been widely noted that zoning is one of the first tools of systemic racism in our country. It is still causing a division that is impacting the way that we foresee a bicycle future. Action 10, we must safeguard against discriminatory enforcement. I've stated the facts that African-Americans are two times more likely to be killed by law enforcement. Enforcement is all of our business. Action 11, we must challenge and eliminate the scary black male narrative. Too many of my black and brown brothers are being jailed, being killed, or incapacitated as a result of this fear. And again, they are two and a half times more likely to be killed. Action 12, we must collect and analyze and disaggregated data on black lives and experiences. We've conducted as a collective, some of the greatest studies on biking in this country, whether we're looking at barriers to access, et cetera. But when you look at those studies, most of them lack sufficient data on black lives and experiences. They also lack it, lack it on brown lives and experiences as well. The question is, why don't you question that? Action 13. We must advocate for the penalization of race-based 911 calls. This involves supporting bills to make false reportings of crime a hate crime when racial, ethnic, sexual, or certain other factors are involved. This is harming all of us. It harms in particular those of us of color who are trying to be present in public space but cannot do so without our mobility being arrested. We must also organize efforts to decriminalize jaywalking across this country. My friend Angie Smith and I have written about this in Bloomberg and City Lab. I invite you to read that article, but jaywalking or the criminalization of it must end today. And along with that, we must also organize efforts to decriminalize bicycling in low-income and BIPOC communities. Why is this important? Well, because too often the most common bike summons, such as riding on the sidewalk, failure to have proper lights or reflectors, failure to use or ride within available bike lanes, failure to obey a traffic control device, these are all or have been used too often as precursors to discriminate, to arrest, to assault, or to harm not only cyclists, but also their families. And this is important because these very people who are harmed, assaulted, et cetera, may be the main ones who are taking care of their very families. So this thing is intergenerational. It, in, it harms not only the individual, but an entire family. And what impacts an entire family in impacts an entire community. And what impacts an entire community impacts an entire country. And then, of course, it wouldn't be right without having a bonus action. 
See, we have to talk about, as I wrap up here, what it means to be a bicycle-friendly community, a strong town, or America's best bike cities in America. It is time to challenge what it means to be friendly or strong and yet inequitable and exclusive. So the question to you to think about is, what does it mean to be a bicycle community or a strong town when black and brown and low income people lack safe, equitable and inclusive access to the very infrastructure, the programs and the initiatives that these communities are rewarded for. See, and these are all my friends, but for every Portland, there is an East Portland. For every Hoboken, New Jersey, there's a Camden, New Jersey. For every Tampa, Florida, there is a Jacksonville, Florida. For every Manhattan, there is a Bronx. For every Chicago, there is a South Side. And so you may be asking the question, or you may make the comment, we're the bicycle community. We're all in this together. We feel you. No, you do not. We are not in the same boat, but we are in the same storm. There is a huge difference and a difference that I need you to acknowledge. And I need you to acknowledge that difference right now because Black people are tired. They can't go jogging. They can't run. They can't be a 10 year old walking with a grandmother, grandfather. They can't breathe. They can't live. They are tired. Our mobility has been arrested. And so you may ask the question, what is next? What is next is that I invite you to this arrested mobility movement where I'll be creating a community of practice by the different modes, whether we're talking biking, walking, taking public transit, et cetera. And what we're gonna do collectively is seek policy systems and environmental changes to unarrest the mobility of black people in this country. I list my personal email because I'm off work today. And I want this movement to not be a political one. I want it to be a political one. And so it's important that I separate myself from the institutions when making that statement. But we must come up with the policies to address the fact that my people's mobility and your people's mobility has been arrested. I want to again thank the League of American Bicyclists, the board, their staff, and others for having me here. And I look forward to answering your questions. Take care. Charles, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you for your words, for your wisdom, for your time today, sharing that presentation with all of us at the National Bike Summit. Um, it's truly my honor and privilege to be able to share the virtual stage with you today. So um, thanks again for being here. Um, we're getting a lot of very positive uh, comments in the chat from people um, who I think are really moved as I've been uh, every time I see you give any presentation. Um, Thank you. So uh, we've, we're receiving lots of questions and I encourage people to continue typing your questions into the Q&A. Um, we'll do our best to get to as many as possible in the next uh, 15 minutes or so that we have with Charles. Um, and I asked Bill to be on today too so we can ask him questions if, uh, if we have any uh, to make this a conversation. Um, I'd like to start with my own question if I can. Um, and it's actually something I've been wanting to ask you, Charles, for months now. Um, you talk about being a street level researcher and about the importance of valuing and listening to the lived experience of individuals. Um, and I couldn't agree with that more. Um, but it occurs to me leading a national program that gives out awards and recommendations to communities that I've never been to. Um, that it's almost in direct conflict to the very, you know, the basic premise of uh, a national organization giving out awards. Um, so I would love it if you could sort of speak to that, the role of national organizations and, and to that effect, uh, extent, you know, state and, and other sort of larger institutions um, like the League and, and how we can help from this sort of pullback scale um, and how we can partner more with 
uh, all the local folks on the call today and how they can help us do better too. Yeah, well, well thank you. Um, I do identify as a street level researcher. I, I do first and foremost, because as I stated, I believe that many of the answers to our question, the solutions are found in the streets among the very people in which many of us unfortunately are fearful of engaging with. See, many people in our industry want equity to be a desktop exercise. If they're honest with themselves, as well as these national organizations, many of them are ill-equipped to really address the systemic harm and the institutional harm that have been done to Black, Brown, and low-income people across this country. Many of them feel like they lack the power, they lack the know-how, or they even lack the resources to address this issue. I say, if that is true of you, diversify your staff, not only locally, but also nationally. Also invite people to have these real conversations about what is taking place in our community. Unfortunately, it took many organizations. Um, they waited until the deaths of Ahmaud Aubrey and Brianna Taylor to have real conversations about these issues. What I love about my story is that I talked about that before that happened. See, moving forward, everyone will be judged on who they were before and after the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Because again, this is more than a desktop exercise. This is more than a lens you put on. And so what I need from national organizations is to diversify their staff, uh, to partner with um, organizations of color who have been doing this work forever. Uh, so that you can address the issues at the local level. And then lastly, um, when it comes to these bicycle friendly awards that we all joke about, uh, perhaps you should have the communities weigh in, particularly the black and brown communities as to whether they think these communities are indeed bicycle friendly. I think if you conducted such an effort, you'll find that there's misalignment. They would say they lack access to the safe, um, equitable and inclusive infrastructure that is highlighted in these applications that you receive. And so we have an obligation given the power that we have individually and collectively to right these wrongs. I'm asking for urgency and I'm asking that that starts today. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. And I, um, you know, we, we do surveys and I've, I've heard you say, I think it was on a podcast last summer that um, you're sick of, of people doing surveys and, and we just added a demographic question to the end of our bicycle friendly community public survey for the very first time uh, last year because before that we had no idea who was responding um, and, and it finally occurred to us of course that uh, <laughs> we need to know that um, and you won't be surprised to to see the demographics of who's responding to our surveys right now. Thank um, you. So Thank you. my uh, quick plug to all the advocates on the call who help us uh, distribute those survey links in your communities, please help us uh, distribute those uh, more equitably throughout your community. So we're, we are hearing um, from everyone and we will do our best to do our part and um, you know, making sure we have the right partners on the ground to get the surveys out and yeah welcome ideas on what else we should be doing beyond surveys. Um, that brings me to the next question. And this, this is the question that got the most uptick votes on Whova, um, ways that allies can help. And I, I wanna start sort of by unpacking that a little bit because I, I often struggle with the concept of ally because I feel like it emphasizes an us versus them. And I know the, the goal of it is exactly the opposite. Um, and so I'm curious what you think when you hear that question um, and then if you don't mind taking a stab at answering it, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I never mind. Um, I understand why some people have an issue with the term ally. Personally, I, I don't have a problem with it. I mean, I welcome anyone to the table that is willing to check their privilege at the door, at the door to be a part of uh, finding the solutions to these problems. So uh, the advocates or the allies can do the very same thing that the organizations could do at, at a local and national level. They can check their privilege. They can humble themselves. They can educate themselves on the plight of black, brown, and low income people in this country. They could share their power, their resources with these communities. And then they can kind of champion causes that elevate uh, our people uh, from a social 
and political standpoint. And most importantly, um, don't be quiet. I mean, because being quiet about these issues um, helps to perpetuate those very issues. We need you to be vocal when you have concerns about our plight, and we need you to do that more often. Uh, we also need you to um, diversify your bicycle organizations as well. If we were to conduct a study of the demographics of bicycle advocacy groups across this country, I suspect they're probably 90% any given race, depending on how they're organized. And so that needs to happen. We can't just integrate communities um, and not integrate the bicycle community. And so that is critically important. Lastly, the um, allies could um, address the issues within their homes. A lot of this goes back to who you have access to. I think this first starts within you and then it goes to those next to you or those whom you share an intimate relationship with. Um, so correct your home, then correct your block, then correct your city, and that helps to create the, correct the nation. But before you're coming to you know, solve the problems of Blacks, first solve the problems within your own homes. Yeah. And I do believe you can walk and chew gum so you can do both simultaneously. Yeah. I don't want you to feel like, well, I'll just wait. You right. can walk and chew gum. So I think you can yeah. do both simultaneously. But it's important that you recognize that you must do both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you could even take it a step further back and you start with yourself. <laughs> um, there are a lot of us who, who need that, that first step. Um, so, Bill, that allies question, I want to sort of point to you uh, next and, and ask you your perspective as executive director of the league. Um, how do you see our organization uh, as an ally? What, what is our role? Um, and, you know, same for the move, the bike movement in general. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks for the question. Um, and, and thanks, Charles, for the presentation. It's been, it was, it's been great learning. I, I think, I think that learning process is, is, is huge. So I think the first part for me, really, um, is is realizing that you're not going to be able to figure this out as as a white guy. You know, you're not going to be able to figure this out like immediately. Um, the data is here, the concepts are here, but I mean, we the league has been working on this learning for years, and and you know, we've been through equity trainings and have had uh, we've we've done a lot of the work. But you know, just I think it starts honestly with me personally, as you just said, Amelia. Uh, you know being vulnerable and being willing to like realize that you don't know it all and that you have to listen and that that actually has to turn into action. Um, so I, I think, I think that, that has been a process. I think so for, to be an ally, you know, I look at, I look at my sphere of influence. And so as the executive director of the organization, I'm, I'm, uh, and, and of course, under the leadership of the, of the board of directors, we look at our strategic plan. We look at like, you know, how, how can we integrate this? You know, this, you know, we, we say we changed our mission to be creating a bicycle friendly America for everyone. What does that really mean? So like, I, you know, we have to look at all the program levels. I've been very proud of our team, really including uh, uh, that of equity, diversity, inclusion as, as uh, a lens through which we look at all of our work. Um, but I think we can do more. I think we can, you know, bring in Charles today. What is our sphere of influence? I think part of this is like putting on a national bike summit where, where Charles T. Brown gets to speak and, and, and making sure that we are creating a platform that represents the entire bicycling movement. You know, bicycling isn't just white people. Uh, it's, it's, you know, everybody bikes and and we need to make sure that we're reflecting that and being representative of that and all of our work so yeah i think i think that that's you know where the rubber meets the road i mean we have to continue to do what charles just said which is um uh bring people in uh we have to be i think we have to be not just open but we have to be welcoming you know like we you know it can't just be it can't just be uh, that us versus them thing. It has to be much more big tent. I'm gonna stop talking. I'm gonna stop talking now. But I, 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 I could, uh, I could go on. But uh, I'll leave it there and let Charles talk.
Thanks, Bill. And I was just going to give make one correction. It's not that Charles gets to talk; it's that we get to listen to Charles. So, yeah. of course, of um, course, yeah, you know what I mean. Like, you know, I have I have I, know, I, 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 have, I have a role in making sure that Charles Brown, who I've been friends with absolutely. for years, and is saying amazing things. I'm like, no. I we need him to come, and we need yeah. him to speak. And absolutely, we get to hear him. Everybody yep. gets to hear him. Yep. Thank you. I'm, yeah, I'm personally- Thanks for the correction, Amelia. Thank you. <laughs> That's my job as <laughs> league staff. Um, so Charles, another question for you. Um, a little bit about sort of inclusive planning and um, how to sort of do that outreach properly. Um, sort of two-part question. How, there are a lot of advocates in the room. How do advocates demand it of their communities? Um, and for the community planners and practitioners, um, when there are trust issues that exist for very good reasons, um, how do they accomplish inclusive uh, engagement, outreach, and a planning process? Hire people of whom they have no trust issues with, Black people, Brown people. Again, this goes back to uh, this, this lack of diversity this lack of representation and inclusiveness within these organizations. If you're ill-equipped to do the job, hire people who are equipped to do the job. And in this particular case, when we talk about a, a distrust or mistrust, what we're specifically talking about, and this is why it's important to talk about race and ethnicity in our conversations, we're talking about organizations of whom um, are distrusted by black and brown communities organizations who are predominantly white. So those organizations need to not continue to hire entities that are also predominantly white and who by way of their whiteness are also distrusted by these black and brown communities. So how do you fix it? Hire black, promote black, partner black, team with black, lift black, brown, et cetera. That's how you fix it. Because I've never had an issue in engaging with any black community across North America. Thank you. And I, you know, it's funny, it occurs to me that I've asked several different questions and the answer to almost every single one has been higher black. So I want to make sure the audience hears that a couple times and takes that to heart because that, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, during your presentation, you talked about racial equity action plans um, and we got some requests for good examples out there. Um, do you have any communities you can point people to that are doing this really well or even specific plans? Um, yeah, so here's, here's the challenge of like mentioning someone or some place. When you mention a place, people take it as the gospel and they want to say, well, he said that place was by far the best place for this. I, I want to um, preface my statement by saying no one does it to the level I wish they did it to. Okay, so then now we're clear. A community of which I do appreciate the work that they've done pre Breonna Taylor, pre-George Floyd, uh, would be the city of Oakland. I, I really like what Oakland has done um, and continue to do around not only measuring, uh, but also trying to work through this complexity uh, of issues around what it means to center race in transportation and mobility. So I'll stop there. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so scrolling through questions, um, we've gotten a couple of questions from uh, people who are trying to work with their local police departments um, to implement change and looking for your thoughts on um, how to sort of get this message into those entities in, in the community. Yeah, that's a very difficult one. Um, first of all, a police department has to be willing to listen to these issues. But once you have their ear, I think again, teaming with people who are more knowledgeable in that particular space, people who have research such as my own and others across this country, I'm not um, the only person doing this work. They're doing this work by coastal. 
Um, so I think bringing in, and that's what the Arrest of Mobility uh, platform is gonna be aiming to do, get all these voices in one place so that we can address these systemic issues. And then the hope would be that as a collective, all the groups that are out there, we can uh, better engage with law enforcement. I will say that's not my first um, place that I wanna place my priorities or, or energy towards. I think uh, if we're gonna spend our time collectively, let's, let's address the policies first uh, that give these institutions the sort of liber liberty, the sort of um, autonomy to make these decisions without consequence. Awesome. Thank you so much, Charles. So um, that's actually time for the session. And, and that's a great transition for me to say that um, there's a session happening at our next uh, at our first breakouts uh, on exactly that topic of how some communities are starting to talk about um, the sort of systemic and policy changes. Um, so look for that in the, on the agenda. But there's a bunch of great sessions to choose from. Uh, looking forward to continuing this conversation with all of you in the audience. Um, with you, Charles, thank you so much for your time today. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, we're, we're not done working together. I'll just say that. Um, I think you know that, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I would like to say again, thanks mm -hmm. to you and Bill. Again, it's Women's uh, History Month, so special, special, special thanks to you. Bill, you don't get any of those things. That's just for her in this case. Also, thanks to you know the people that were here today. Um, I can speak that uh, the League of American Bicyclists has been doing a great job at trying to, you know, as Bill stated, first listen to what the challenges have be have been. They've been open to uh, trying to change some of the structures, the processes, and decision making around whether it's research, et cetera. I'm happy to be able to kind of partner with you all. And again, thank you to the audience for being here. Um, if you want to contact me, please use my personal email and um, love to all of you. Peace. Same to you, Charles. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, everybody.